are. We're almost getting through Philippians 2. We've been here a while, but man, what a powerful passage. The Carmen Christi, they call it, the hymn of Christ, where we get not only just so much theology, but just to, to learn about Jesus, all that Jesus was, his very lifestyle, his attitudes that we are called to carry out and live. And, and as we've looked at this, we've seen things like um, well, let's just read through the passage first, and then we'll get started. How's that? Let's go through it. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. This is kind of the conclusion of where we are. And it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. This is Jesus. And gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a powerful, powerful message that we have. And we've looked at this attitude check. Where's our attitude in conjunction with Jesus' attitude? And, and Jesus has shown us some, uh, some amazing things in this passage of how he lived. Like, like when you find your identity in God alone, when, when, when you don't have to fight and pursue your rights and your privileges and your position and your honor and your status. And, and you can just let all that go so that you can just say, I'm yours, God. You are set free to live the way God wants you to live in this world. And then we talked about do nothing out of selfishness. Remember, we had a 30-day challenge. Everybody remember that? Anybody still have your little insert hanging up? The 30-day challenge just to wake up every morning and say, I'm going to do nothing out of selfishness today. What an amazing way to change your family, your, your community, your church, the world. Then we talked about Jesus having humility, making himself nothing, looking out for the needs of others, taking on the very nature of a servant even though he was king of kings and lord of lords, and then living in this attitude of obedience. How are you doing with those attitudes? How's that coming along so far? That's who we're called to be. That's how we're called to live. See, these attitudes that Jesus lived are so contrary, I think, to this fallen, broken world. And, and, and it, it's contrary to our very culture because this world, our culture, it celebrates this exertion of, of power. If someone can exercise power over someone else, we go, ooh, look how amazing that is. And, and self-promotion and, and pursuing rights and privileges and honor and position and status and, and pushing oneself to the front. In fact, the world would tell you this. Worldly wisdom will tell you that you cannot get ahead, you cannot succeed, and you cannot accomplish what needs to be done with these attitudes that Jesus lived. There's no way. And yet God has a completely different answer, a completely different response. See, Jesus showed us how to live the very ethics and values and lifestyle of the kingdom of God. And he showed us that when we are here, we are to live for the kingdom of God, which is the only eternal thing. Not to live for this world, which is temporary, fallen, and broken. And if you put everything into this world, you lose it all, Jesus tells us. But you live for the kingdom and you gain it all. That's what it's about. And Jesus is showing us this. You see, what we have today is God's response, God's final word to the lifestyle of Jesus. And you know what it is? Are everybody ready? Vindication. Elevation of Jesus to the highest place. Resurrection. Everything that is good. See, God honors this lifestyle. But this is something that Jesus has thrown out there. This is something the Bible's thrown out there for a long time. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord teaches a person wisdom, and humility, remember what humility literally means, to be lower? Humility, I love this part, comes before honor. Of course, Jesus said that numerous times. We'll see that. Peter and, and, and James and others, they picked up on this. In fact, James 4.10, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 said the same thing. If you humble yourselves before the Lord, he will in due time lift you up. And the whole idea, now get this, there's, there's two verbs here. One is active, humble yourself. We do that, okay? It's always better to humble yourself than be humbled. Anybody believe that? It's always better to humble yourself than to be humbled. Humble yourself in due time, God's going to show you, and he will, the passive verb, he will lift you up. See, verse 9 becomes like the very fulcrum of, of this passage. Up to verse 9, it's always been about Jesus, his attitude, his lifestyle, his activity that he lived. But in verse 9, we have God, the Father's response to this whole thing, and his response is, Therefore, I love that word, therefore. When you see the word therefore, you have to see what it's there for. Everybody get this, okay? 
Therefore is this conjunction that says, something's happened here, therefore this. Does that make sense? This has happened, therefore this. That's what the whole thing means. And this is God's very response to the whole situation, to everything that's there. It's cause and it's effect. Jesus lived this perfect lifestyle, humility, servanthood, poured out his life unto death. And so what does that mean? Therefore, God exalted him to the very highest place. You see the idea? Boom. God's exaltation of Jesus is his vindication of Jesus' lifestyle, of his attitudes that he lived And he was exalted where? To the highest place, to the place of God's right hand, to that place of honor and power and majesty. See, Ephesians 1, that power is like working uh, of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. And God placed all things under him. He has all authority. He has all power. I could have thrown out 15 scriptures that say this exact same idea, that we understand God has put him to the place where he has all power and authority. He is lifted to the very highest place. And Jesus entrusted himself to God. Even though he let go of of all that he was as God and became nothing, he entrusted himself to God that God would one day show it as proper and as right. And that's what happens. You know, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, um, as you get later into it, verses 23 and 24, it says when they in, were throwing insults at Jesus, he didn't retaliate. You see, when, they, when, they, when, they were, when he was suffering, he, he didn't make threats about all these things, but he simply entrusted himself to the one who he knew judges justly and rightly and properly. That's what we are called to do in this world. Because Jesus humbled himself and went to the very lowest place there is, death and even the grave. Therefore, God says, I exalted him to the highest place. It's this total reversal. But Jesus talked about this. Luke 18, 14, Jesus said, well, anyone who exalts himself is going to be humbled, but the one who humbles himself is going to be exalted. God's elevation of Jesus as he exalts him to that glorious rank, which is an amazing thing because it was Jesus by right I mean, that's who he was. He is God. By his very nature, this was his place, but he let all of that stuff go, went to nothing, and God says, I'm going to raise him right back up here where he belongs to show you this is how you live in this world and for my kingdom. It's all bestowed back upon him. See, Jesus showed us the way to live. And so my question today is this. Are we willing to live this lifestyle? Even if the world mocks it, even if it means sacrifice in our lives, are we willing to entrust ourselves so completely to God to know that in the end, this lifestyle that we live will be vindicated by God and shown to be proper and true? It's tough because we live in a fallen, broken world where everything says the exact opposite and we think we got to live that way. And Jesus says, no, you don't. No, you don't, as we live for the kingdom. (laughs) So not only is Jesus exalted to the highest place, and that's point number one, number two we find out, Jesus is given the name that is above every other name, the power of the name. And as we see this, Jesus is it's not that Jesus was given the name Jesus because other people had that name, but that he's given the name Lord which is powerful. You know, in the Hebrew Middle Eastern culture of the day, especially, this is kind of neat. Lots of people don't really know this. Um, There was always this day, and it's kind of a rite of passage and a special day when a father would come out with his son, and he would come out to the village, to the town, to all the townspersons, to the family, to the friends, to to all the business associates, and whatever was there. And, 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 And he would say this, my son now shares the authority of my name, okay? See, if my son says something, it's just like I said it. If my son does something, it's just like I did it. My son shares the power and the authority of my name, and he would speak it to everyone. Now, here's God. He's saying, my son shares the power and the authority of my name, and I want the world to know it because I've lifted him up and sat him at the highest place. 
and given him the name that is above every other name. You see, my son was selfless and he was humble and he was obedient even to the point of death and death on a cross. Oh my goodness, how, how low can you go? And yet everyone thought it was weakness. They thought it was shameful. They thought he only did it because he lacked power to be anything else. But God says, I'm declaring to you today that my son shares the power and the authority of my name. I mean, what's in a name? Really, what's in a name? That Jesus is given the name that's above all others, the name of Lord. You see, name represents the power and the authority behind the person who has that name. Let me give you an example. You, I bet you everybody knows this story, but you're going to hear it again. You ready? 1 Samuel 17. There's this little war going on between the Philistines and, and, and the Israelites, okay? And um, the Philistines have this amazingly huge man. He's a giant. He's called Goliath. No, one's a, no one is, is willing to fight him. They're all afraid of him. He's been fighting since he was a young man. He, he beats everybody, okay? And so they're out on the battle lines, and it's kind of, this is how it used to work. There'd be, you know, armies back here, and, and they would come out, and they'd kind of, one person taunt back and forth. And, and he would sit there, and he taunts God, the very name of God, and he taunts God's people and everything else. <clears throat> it just happens that David, who's just a young shepherd boy, he's out there and he hears this. He goes, come on, people, you're going to let him talk about God that way? Who's going to go out and fight him? And everybody's like, oh. He says, okay, I'll go do it. And he steps out there, not with a bunch of spears and swords and all these things, but all that he knows as a shepherd boy, he's got a sling and a few stones. And he goes out there to this giant, and the giant sees him. You know what his first words are? What am I, a dog? You come at me with some sticks to spank me? What is going on with this little guy coming out here, right? Here's what David says. You come against me with spear and sword and javelin and all those mighty weapons. I come against you in, are you ready? The name of the Lord, the God of the armies of heaven. And today, guess what? He's going to give me your head. Can you imagine? <laughs> but we know that stone was just the perfect size. It was done, right? He understood something that we have got to get in our lives. He understood the very power of the name of the Lord. He understood the authority and the power that when you step out in the name of the Lord and you're accomplishing the very purpose and the very mission that God has for you within your life, we can call upon the power of the name of the Lord and mighty things can happen. Anybody want some mighty things to happen in your own life maybe? Maybe in, in the life of our church, maybe in the life of our community, in our world? We have that power in the name of the Lord. He was exalted to the highest place. He was given a name above every other name, Lord. See, Jesus talked about that all the time. John 14, 15, 16, Jesus kept saying, if you just, uh, uh, anything you ask in my name, it's going to be done for you. Now, you have to remember, this is about the purpose of God and what God's doing. This is not about God, I think I want a million dollars. That's not necessarily going to happen just because you say in the name of Jesus to it. It's not some magical incantation that makes something happen. It's about the very power and flow from heaven, from God himself, flowing through us to accomplish what needs to be done, okay? Let me give you an example. I'll read this to you. This is good. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3 and 4. Now in Acts, you know, of course, Jesus died. He's resurrected, gone back, and the Spirit has fallen upon him, and things are starting to happen. The church is beginning to grow. <clears throat> I love this story. So Peter and John, they go to the temple three times a day to pray. One day they're going to the temple, and, and sure enough, there's this person who's been crippled from birth, okay, a long time. And he calls to Peter and John. He says, hey, 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 give me, give me some money. I need money. I need help. And Peter and John stop, and they look at him, and they say, look at us. And he's thinking, hey, I'm going to get some money now. And Peter and John, of course, say the thing that all of us say, silver and gold, I don't have any. You know, money, I don't have much. I, I can't give that to you. But what I do have, he says, I'm going to give to you. Right now, as he takes him by the hand, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he lifts him up, and he is completely healed. And this man who from, from birth has been crippled and not able to do anything, he begins to walk, and it says, and leap and jump up and down and praise God. How did that happen? In the name of Jesus, he says. 
the power and the authority of Jesus, this is going to take place. Now, can you imagine that this maybe caused a little stir? There's some people coming to check this out. Here's this guy who's been crippled from birth. All of a sudden, he's dancing around, prancing around, praising God. And they're like, what's going on over here? So they all go over there, and they go, what's happening here? And here's what Peter says. He says, oh, people of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you look at us as if it's under our power or godliness that we made this person walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You see, you handed him off to be killed. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. And by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. And it is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through it that he has found this complete healing, the name of Jesus. You flip over to the next chapter, chapter 4, it even gets better. All the people, now the, the religious leaders, they're, they're finding out about this and they're going, hmm, we don't like this whole thing of all this happening. So they, they go to talk with Peter and John. It's late in the day, so they just throw them in jail overnight. Isn't that nice? The next day they bring them out and they say, okay, <clears throat> here's their question. And I like this. By what power or in what name do you do this healing stuff? <laughs> Peter, filled with the Spirit, speaks to me and says, If we're being a call to account today for an act of kindness that we showed to a crippled person who was healed, then I want you to know this, and everybody else here in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ whom you crucified, but God raised him to the dead and lifted him up and elevated him that this man stands completely healed before you. In fact, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven and earth and under the earth by which a person can be saved. Whew, what do you think about that? The name of Jesus carries with it the power, the authority of all that God wants to do. You see, the name of Jesus, he's been given the name above every other name as Lord. It means we now have power and authority. We have Jesus' presence. We have his healing. We have his salvation. We have literally his mission and his purpose that can flow through us to be at work in us. Anybody need some work within your life? Anybody say, man, I, I might have a broken place here or there maybe where the very power and authority of the one who sits above everyone says, I can come heal you. I can come make you whole. I can come change your life if you want it. He says, man, we can change this world. You know these people did? 120 people changed the world. It is different today than it would have been because they went out and carried out a mission and a purpose. Not just Israel, but it's spread, and it's even through the world today. The name of Jesus. So there's another important part of this, and it's not really the, the message, but i got to get this out there as well. You see, when you talk about Jesus giving the name Lord, it talks about the fact that he has lordship over everything. We get this? Today, the cosmos, everything that's ever been created is under the lordship of Jesus. It's not always recognized. Jesus isn't always exercising his full authority over everything, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have power and authority over everything that's there. And he does. And it's a powerful thing. I know a lot of us would say, well, why don't you just come and exercise your full authority, Jesus? Why don't you come do away with the brokenness in this world? Why don't you come do away with sin and sickness and death and the very curse of sin and all these problems that's here? Well, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 through 13 will tell you the answer to that, and it's very simple. It's not because God's slow. It's not because God doesn't want to do anything. It's because God wants no one to perish. But he wants everyone to know the truth of Jesus and all that he's done for us. And so he lets it go so that we can continue not only being changed within our own lives, but to share this good news with the world and who we are called to be. But trust this, in the future, the lordship of Jesus will be complete over the cosmos. You know, I put some of these passages, I don't know if I put this one in there. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it. Read Revelation 21, it's very clear. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Sin and its curse will be gone. Jesus will sit on the throne. And this is, this, it just amazes me. I'll throw another passage in here. What the hey? I know it's the first week of NFL. It's okay. We'll get you out of here. 
See, John's seeing this vision in heaven, and this is what just blows me away. John sees this vision in heaven one time, and, and, and there's a scroll that's supposed to be opened up, and he, they said no one is found worthy to open a scroll, not in, on an earth, not in heaven. No one has been found worthy to open a scroll. So John begins to weep. No one is here who could do this. And someone taps him on the shoulder and says, wait a minute, there is one who can do this. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and John turns around, he thinks, I'm going to see this ferocious beast of a lion that could tear this thing apart. He says, I turned around and I looked, and there I saw a lamb that had been slain. I get that. You see, he went to the lowest, lowest, lowest place, and yet he is now exalted to the highest, highest, highest place. And he alone is the one who can do these things. That blows me away. He is Lord of all. So what does it mean that Jesus is Lord of all? What does it mean for my life? Think about that. If Jesus is Lord of the cosmos and everything, is he Lord of my life? Or do I just live the way I want to live and kind of forget about that kind of stuff? Lord. Is it reflected in my life? What I say, how I live, what I do. Do I live under the lordship of Jesus and his power, his authority, his mission? Or do I just do things the way I want to do them? Because as we're going to see in this next line, not only does he exalt him to the highest place, give him the name above every other name, but the day is coming that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess, you are Lord. Everyone. Every being in heaven and on earth and under the earth, in the cosmos, in the heavenly realms, is going to claim and acknowledge Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Every created thing is going to confess either by choice, where we say, ah, you are God, and we can bow in choice, or by compulsion, <laughs> when we get there and God says, now you see who I am and you realize it, boom, it's going to happen. See, why would we not recognize it now? Why would we not surrender ourselves to God now, knowing that he is the one wanting to give us new life to live in right now. See, Jesus, not only is he Lord, but he holds all power and authority. He has conquered death. He's conquered the grave. He's conquered the, the, the curse of sin, sin's power in our life, the very brokenness of this world. And he says, I want to come bring wholeness in your own lives and in the lives of everyone here. And we're called to do this. Remember, I started with Ephesians 1. Here, here's the part right before what we looked at. See, Paul has this great prayer. He prays that the eyes of our heart could be enlightened so that we'll know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints, and get this line right here. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power, where? Toward us who believe. And this is in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he brought about when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the great and highest place that there is. God wants to be at work in our life as the way that he did when he took Jesus from the grave and lifted him up and set him at the highest place that there is. He says that kind of power can be at work in your life and in my life if we want it. Anybody need a little help from Jesus today? Maybe? Wow. If we just take it and live it. I believe God wants to do amazing work in our lives because that same power that lifted Jesus from the grave, I think that very power is for us right now. And he wants to trade our brokenness for the wholeness he wants to give us. See, at some point we, are, we, we see and we hear this, every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I don't want to wait until I go stand before God to surrender and acknowledge. In fact, the scripture is quite clear. You want to make this decision while you're walking here on this earth. You don't want to step into eternity not having done this or made this choice. 
You see, on, on earth we can make this choice, and, and just really the choice flows out of our very love and admiration for God. It's a, our love and admiration and our recognition of God's great love and his mercy and his grace and his power and all that he's done for us. And we can say that. We can say, yes, you are Lord. We can bow down on our knee, and we can, and we can proclaim it with our mouth. You are Lord, and I give you permission to be Lord of my life. You see how that, that's, a, that's a powerful flow. But on the other hand, it says, if we don't want to do that, we can step into eternity. And guess what? God's going to be there, and they're going to see the truth of all that God is. And, and by compulsion, they're going to be, oh, that's not the place you want to be. I had some passages, and I'm not going to go through them so much, but I want you to get this, because this is important. Throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, both places it talks about this time when there will be this, this final reckoning. Some to good, some to not good, okay? A final reckoning. You can even go just to Daniel. In the book of Daniel 12, he talks about uh, the, the great prince, Michael the archangel. He's going to come, and, and all those who are sleeping in the dust of the earth, all those who are dead, will be raised up, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting disgrace. Jesus, he says, there's a time coming when God's going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? Those who did what was right, those who did what was wrong. There's going to be a separation. There's going to be a reckoning of all that takes place. Jesus, in John 5, he says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me, you have eternal life. You will never be condemned for their sins, but they already have passed from death unto life. That sounds good. I like passing from death unto life. But just a couple verses later, here's what Jesus shares in such a powerful way. Don't marvel at this. He's talking about himself here. For, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice, my voice, Jesus says, and they're going to come forth. And those who have done good, they're going to come to a resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, to a resurrection of condemnation. You see, this is not stuff you're just making up. Jesus is pretty serious with this. How about John 3.16, the most famous passage that there is, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish. That means the possibility of something not good. As Paul talks about or, or, uh, in Thessalonians, being shut out from the presence and the glory of God forever. That's not a place you want to be. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but listen to what it says. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. You see, here's what the problem is. In our lives, we think we're kind of floating around here in neutral territory. Anybody ever think this? Neutral territory. Uh, if maybe I'll believe in Jesus and then good things. Maybe I won't believe in Jesus, bad things. But I, I'll, I'll make that decision sometime. Jesus says, that's not how it works, folks. Every single one of us has sinned. We've fallen short of the very glory of God. You are all under condemnation unless you make a choice to believe in Jesus and have your life changed. You see that? A world that we're to go proclaim the truth to. Here's the thing I know today. Every one of us sitting here, every one of us hearing what's, what's being spoken here today can beyond a shadow of a doubt know that we have surrendered ourselves to God and acknowledged what Jesus has done through us, for us through the cross and giving us new life. In fact, I believe this wholeheartedly. Today, every knee can bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord, and I'm asking you that you might do this with me today. Can we do this? And I'm going to be asking you to just pray with me if you would, okay? This might be the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like, the, prayed a prayer like this, or it could be the thousandth time, because there's only one way to give your life to Jesus, and it's to give it to him every single day, okay? So if you just close your eyes and just, just you don't have to repeat these words, just pray them with me in your hearts. Lord, I believe and I acknowledge that you went to the very lowest place and through the cross and then your resurrection, you have redeemed my life. Forgive me of all the places I've fallen short and the sin in my life and set me free from that sin that destroys the true abundant life you want me to have. Please give me that abundant life now in the place of that old life. 
Lord, I surrender to you. My knees are bowed. My tongue is confessed that you are Lord of my life and you are Lord of all. Set me free from all the things that bind me. Give me that new life and help me to see that you have lifted me up and seated me with Jesus. Amen.